Good morning, good evening, and welcome to this PV Magazine webinar. I'm Tristan Rayner, editor at PV Magazine, speaking to you live from a cold but sunny Berlin this morning. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Today we are focusing on tracker development solutions that increase reliability and reduce O&M costs. And I'm especially looking forward to the next hour because we're hearing from Trina Tracker and independent experts on all things trackers, yield improvements, and how active development is going into making trackers better for all terrain and wind conditions. Uh, some of today's topics will include Trina Tracker's smart control system, preventative component design, lowering failure rates and increasing lifetime availability, insight into Trina Tracker's R&D efforts from its very own engineers, and finally, a third party viewpoint on trackers along with tips on initial site evaluation and more. And before we start a little backstory, so I did undertake some pre-webinar reconnaissance at Intersolar earlier this month down in Munich. Um, took a look at Trina Tracker's agile tracker setup that was installed um, at their booth uh, with a couple of product managers and engineers running me through the physical setup there. So that was great and will help us all get to the bottom of some important topics around reliability and O&M. After all, we're here to peek behind the curtain to understand operational excellence, experience and R&D and how that results in better solutions. And it's going to be really intriguing to hear from those in the field. So to talk it through, we're joined by four presenters today to talk about the, all these developments. And if you can all turn on your cameras briefly, please, allowing our attendees to put some faces to the names. So we have, starting with Andrew Gohuli, Trina Tracker, Head of Utility Solution Sales in APAC who will discuss how smart system controlling algorithms are optimizing yields and reliability, and Trina Tracker's real-time SCADA monitoring system, a new product to be launched within the coming weeks. Further presenting today, uh, next up is Felix Sabanda, Research and Development Manager, Senior Manager at Trina Tracker, um, who will discuss the hands-on engineering taking place that leads to design improvements, improved quality controls, and finding the lowest failure rate possible for components. Also joining our webinar, is Alvaro Galagos, Head of Operations at Trina Tracker with 20 years of experience, who will speak about his, his insights working on lowering failure rates and increasing lifetime availability with O&M considerations, tips and guidance. And joining as an independent party, Steve Caldwell, Senior Project Manager at Enzin Australia, who will share his insights from his consulting and advisory experience in solar projects. So it's a great mix of experts today, and we should have quite an insightful set of presentations designed to inform. So following the speakers, we'll also have our usual questions and answers. So please do feel free to submit your questions. And just on that note, let me touch on some housekeeping before our speakers start. So as I said, please do get involved, write, quest write questions. We'll be introducing them throughout the discussion today or during the main Q&A sessions. So please don't hesitate in to, to send in your questions to our presenters via the GoToWebinar control panel. We've already had some questions come in pre-event, and I can only assure you that with your, request, with your questions added into the mix throughout the presentation, that this will be a better event. Um, and just to head off one question we always get, will the slides be available afterwards? Yes, all registrants will be receiving an email from the GoToWebinar portal with a link to the recording, and that can be shared with friends and colleagues after the event today as well. And of course, the PV Magazine webinar team is standing by to answer any questions you have about GoToWebinar, or any other administrative matters. So without further ado, let's get started. Now we'll have Andrew Gahuli, Trina Tracker Head of Utility Solution Sales in APAC, presenting the software side of, tra of tracking. All right, Andrew, take it away. Thank you, Tristan. You can, uh, you can see my screen, I think, now. Uh, so yeah, thanks for those insights from Intersolar, uh, Tristan. Uh, sorry I couldn't make it. We've uh, been unable to leave Australia uh for the the past year and a bit so hoping to get over there soon uh so good morning afternoon evening wherever you may be uh, as tristan says i'm andy gilhooley i lead trina's utility solution sales in asia pacific uh, i hope everyone joining us is keeping safe and well in these strange times that we live in um i actually live in in melbourne australia uh, which recently took the ignominious crown of being the, the most locked down city in the world so uh until until very recently. So we've come out of that and it's encouraging to see things getting back to some sense of normality. Um, I just want to thank our friends at PV Magazine for once again facilitating such a, a well attended and interesting session. And um, we really hope that the, the materials we share with you today, our audience are, are of interest to you. So we'll just uh, 
we'll get a bit of a, bit of a run through on what we're going to be looking at today in the running order. I'll firstly be looking at Trina as a company uh, and, the, and our technology, as well as some of how uh, some of our innovations applied in our control system for our trackers and a lot more value for our customers. Then my colleagues Felix and Alvaro will discuss our long-term view on component and system level design and engineering um, and how that facilitates more cost-effective O&M. Uh, and then finally, uh, Steve Coldwell from our, our value customer Enzem will be giving us some insights into the approaches they take on their O&M and asset management uh, before opening it up, it up for some questions at the end. So most of you will no doubt be familiar with Trina as a vertically integrated module manufacturer uh, with the, the largest capacity in the industry, public listed. Uh, we were announced recently by Bloomberg New Energy Finance as uh, the most bankable brand in the industry for the sixth year in a row. Uh, but a, a bit about the, the lineage and the history of Trina in the tracking space. So uh, back in 2008, uh, 17, there was a, a Spanish tracker company called Enclave. Um, they deployed uh, over five gigawatts of tracking technology into all major global markets. Then in the second half of 2018, uh, Trina acquired a, a controlling stake in Enclave. Um, and then in the, the second half of 2020, Trina increased that, that investment to 100%, making, uh, making the tracker business a, a wholly owned subsidiary um, of the business. Um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, our offering to the market, it's important to note that all of the warranty certification for our, our solution is uh, is named and backed by the Trina parent company and not some, some kind of obscure uh, offshore subsidiary. Uh, so we, we really do believe that it's, its position itself with that big brother of the Trina parent behind us as the most bankable offering in the industry. So since the acquisition uh, of, of the tracker business um, and, and the, uh, the integration of the tracker business into the wider Trina organization, we've now increased the track record of deployment to over seven gigawatts, uh, including some of the largest uh, tracker projects on the planet. Um, we, uh, we have offices in every main market um, and, and production centers in Europe, uh, the United States, the Middle East, Latin America, and also Australia and India and China in Asia Pacific. Uh, in terms of our, our roadmap uh, and pipeline, so we, we recently won our first deals in India uh, and we will be signing deals totaling over 120 megawatts for our trackers to be built in the Australia region for next year. So we'll briefly just touch upon what makes Trina's offering unique in the marketplace. So. Uh, Trina were the first mover to the large format modules uh, early last year, firstly 500, then 550, 600, and more latterly uh, 670 watts, uh, using the, the large 210 millimeter G12 wafers. Um, so it, it, it's important to note that because these, these 550 modules and larger are, are actually 20% longer than a conventional 500 watt module. Uh, so that's really important when you consider it in a tracker application and applying all requisite due diligence to, uh, to ensure structural ad adequacy of the tracker and the component design. Um, also, uh, the Trina modules use the large cells, so the operating voltage is lower. Uh, so we can, we can run longer strings of these, uh, these modules as well. Um, and we've specifically engineered the, the tracker structures to accommodate these larger modules in longer strings. Um, what we're certainly seeing at Trina is as, as more, re, more gigawatts of renewable capacity is built out, we are, we're seeing a, a trend towards sites becoming increasingly challenging, either in terms of irregular boundary and even terrain, strong winds and cyclones, or uh, challenging geotech in terms of rocks or cohesiveless soil. Uh, or corrosivity. So we've really, uh, what my colleagues will elaborate on is how the approach we've taken in our product design to ensure that our technology is uh, cost effective and efficient to install at the lowest construction risk in, in every possible site condition. So we'll just have a brief look at the, the two different types of tracker that we, we offer. So on the left here, we've got our two import rate Vanguard single row. 
Um, that's uh, uh, that's specifically engineered, as I say, to accommodate these large modules in long string. Um, we've worked with world leading wind consultancies uh, to do the wind tunnel testing to ensure that the, the tracker is absolutely uh, fit for purpose from a structural perspective in terms of dynamic loading and second order effects and so forth. So for the two portrait, we've had to go to a multiple point drive system to uh, to ensure that it uh, it's, it stands up to the, these operating wind conditions, uh, but there's no links between the rows east to west, so there's completely unimpeded vehicle access row to row, which is really good for O and M. Um, and because uh, we we we've, we've basically uh, driven the engineering to deliver a super low foundation count, so in tandem with Trina's 650 watt modules, this tracker can require as few as 100 foundations per megawatt. Uh, so we, we say this tracker is best for the challenging sites in terms of geotech or maybe sites that are prone to flood inundation or terrain because they've got a really good slope tolerance because they're not linked uh, or really good for markets with high prevailing cost of labor. On the right hand side, we've got our one in portrait uh, dual row agile tracker um, that uh, motorizes only 50% of the rows and links mechanically only to one neighboring row. So you have completely unimpeded access on 50% of the rows, which is good for O&M, uh, and reduces the num number of motors and drivetrain components in the order of 30 to 40% per megawatt, and reduces that, that number of critical components in, in service. Uh, so we say that that tracker is best for less challenging markets, uh, or, or markets with a, a lower prevailing cost of labor. Uh, just in case you missed it, uh, Trina recently launched our white paper on, on operation and maintenance, and that touches upon many of the topics we're talking about here in, in much more detail. We'll make the link available for that uh, available after this webinar. And at its core, the Trina, Trina Tracker offering, we, we use proprietary tracker and system level control uh, platforms. Uh, that was that was viewed very favorably by DNV in their technology review because we're not beholden or uh, or locked into any one uh, external entity for such a critical component and part of the tracker system. Um, at, a, at a tracker level, we use controllers that utilize machine learning to minimize all instances of near shading and boost the bifacial performance in heavy cloud cover. Uh, we use, utilize deep analytics of the power plant controller level down to actually string level, uh, which gives a, an, gives a really granular approach to the, the data and enables really efficient use uh, of our own and resources and enables us to, to really focus that, especially prior to truck rolling to the, the site for our, for our customers, which is, again, really important in, in markets with high labor costs. Um, and it really maintains a safe and reliable asset at all times, including in extreme weather events such as high wind, snow, hail and flooding. So moving forward, Trina is investing heavily in our SCADA, our IoT and automation platforms uh, to take a leadership position in terms of O&M and asset management. We really think this is a, a gap in the market and is really underserved uh, by most of our, our competitors in the tracker space. So we're going to be taking plant performance and optimization to that next level uh, beyond merely monitoring uh, and having a base level of quite rudimental control of the tracker. We're actually also uh, incorporating best practices from other industries in terms of asset management, uh, such as predictive and prescriptive maintenance uh, to in, in the first half of next year, um, to use IoT and automation uh, to and implement an algorithm-based diagnostics um, to monitor key operating parameters that can import, inform the plant operator of a potentially critical component failure ahead of such a failure event occurring. Uh, we can also automate things such as robot cleaning, and things like putting the modules in maximum tilt during heavy rain and hail events to maximize cleaning and minimize micro crack from, from hail damage and so forth. And then finally, as I say, uh, our overall SCADA and system level control monitoring, it, it is proprietary to Trina. You can see our global dashboard here and uh, we, we can see there are uh, uh, an aggregate availability uptime well in excess of 99%. That's uh, usually a key concern for clients who, who have not used trackers before. Uh, if we just move on to the next dashboard here, we can see a, an overall power plant level control uh, with generation and weather status, uh, as well as side-by-side -side comparison of each power block within the, within the, the solar farm. 
And then finally, we can go down to individual tracker level with really fine monitoring on wind speed and comparison of the, the actual versus the target angle on every single tracker unit. Um, so that, that enables us to offer uh, enhanced value and, and in certain instances offer such value adds to our customers such as uh, tracker uptime guarantees and so forth. So uh, at that stage, I'll hand it over to my erstwhile colleague, Felix, and he'll discuss our O&M with you in more detail. Yes, thank you, Andy. Very interesting to see the uh, lifetime availability stats there and the management platform at work. Uh, great to see some screenshots. Um, and for everyone, in case you've joined late, that was Andrew Gihuli, Trina Tracker Head of Utility Solution Sales in APAC. Um, and as Andy said, we continue the presentations now with Felix Sabanda, Research and Development Senior Manager at Trina Tracker, with insights into hands on engineering taking place at Trina Tracker. So, Felix, when you're ready. Um, hello. Um, first of all, I will start my presentation speaking about uh, truckers. Uh, um, we have uh, two types of, of truckers, as, as uh, was told before. Uh, first, uh, I want to speak about Vanguard. Vanguard GP is, is a 2P trucker that um, <clears throat> uh, for for this type of truckers, uh, usually um, who we want is to reduce the wind uh, resistance because uh, as it is a very very big uh, trucker. Uh, we will have problems if we have uh, very big loads on the on the panels. By this reason, usually these truckers are designed to go to a stop positions of zero degrees or or near zero degrees. Uh, this is a good solution for, to prevent this, but it has a problem. It uh, it always increases the the um, uh, instability of the trucker. Uh, to solve this problem, uh, we go to a multi-drive solution uh, where we decide to put uh, four actuators on the outer trucker and three actuators on the inner ones. It is uh, the most uh, rigid uh, trucker in the industry, maybe, because of this solution. And uh, uh, we can reach this only using one, one motor that uh, transmits the power to all of these four or three actuators. Um, with this, uh, we are able to increase the stability without uh, uh, an increase on the on the or not big increase uh, on the on the maintenance cost and uh, and uh, availability of the trucker. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, the next uh, one thing that we want to explain is the agile trucker. In this case, uh, this is a one-piece solution. Uh, here, we decide to go to a bureau system, um, and uh, the key of this of this trucker uh, is to be as flexible as possible because. Uh, uh, the, the two uh, the two row truckers usually have have the problem that uh, um, they have a rigid levers that, uh, that transmit the movement to one row to the other, and uh, to solve this, uh, that is the solution that we have before too. Uh, we decide to to go to uh, two slip wind drives uh, joined by a cardan connection. This cardan joint uh, allow us to, to be as flexible as if we only have uh, one row trucker, but uh, with the with the benefits that we reach when we have a, a two row, like for example, uh, have only one motor to move uh, two truckers. Of course, uh, this is an obvious um, benefit for assembly, for maintenance, and for control. And uh, other solutions uh, implemented like uh, bearings and other protective elements that we have uh, allow us to be uh, very, very flexible. Uh, the other improvement that we introduce is to elevate the transmission bar uh, that we can show here, uh, because um, uh, if this transmission bar is very near to the, to the ground, uh, we can have problems uh, with the environmental because um, we ha can have oxidation and so on. And uh, uh, this transmission is who um, uh, 
uh, allow to to move the the second row is very important to keep it safe. Um, about the components, uh, I want to start uh, speaking about the bearing. Uh, the, it may be one of more significant or representative uh, components that we have. Uh, this is a spherical bearing, uh, not cylindrical uh, as most of the comp of the bearings of the the market. And uh, with this bearing, we are allowed to to avoid uh, calibration during during the installation process to minimize the structural stress and to enable uh, very big uh, uh, ramming tolerances. Um, <clears throat> uh, this. This is designed to be self lubricated and uh, to minimize the maintenance cost. Other very important component that we have is the Trina clamp. Uh, this, this, this is a fixation method for panels and um, it saves more or less the 50% of the installation time because uh, here uh, we assemble one panel and another one to the pulling only fixing uh, it with two nuts as you can see here uh, it is very big benefit when you are assembling and allow you to to have a very good assembly on a very fast time <clears throat> about uh, structural parts uh, we have uh, uh, the post design I was focused uh, initially on really uh, increase the section of the, the piles to try to reduce the number of posts per, per trucker. Uh, it, it means that uh, if you have less posts, you will have less risks of have problems on ramming and so on. And of course, it saves money when you are making an installation. About uh, torture farm pooling, uh, we, we focus our design on avoid uh, our dynamical effects and uh, we have a full test of these components in fatigue and and uh, and uh, and we analyze in very detail how they are exposed to the environmental conditions that provoke vibrations and so on <clears throat> Uh, next, uh, I, I want to speak about the, the, the cleaning robots. Uh, this is a good example about how um, we um, are listening our customers' requirements. Uh, this uh, this integration, because it's not uh, our own product, we, we, we buy this product for, for other companies uh, and we integrate it on our trucker. Uh, this was requested by our clients and uh, we make a full study about how to integrate it, uh, how elements was needed like ramps, a bridge, uh, charging points and so on. And uh, we finished the, the development of a solution to, to, to put some of these robots in our truckers. And uh, from this uh, um, starting point, we are, we are starting another new project to increase the number of roads that we can have with our truckers and uh, to, to increase its reliability and to make uh, the life of our customers more easy if they want to put the roads of course um, <clears throat> next i want to speak about the, the wind tunnel test um, for us the 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 wind tunnel test is the more or less the most important thing that, uh, that we study when, when we make a tracker because uh, it uh, shows us how the tracker uh, um, will act when he is exposed to the, to the wind. Um, as, it, as it is very critical um, study, we decide to go to the with the two leaders of the of the industry, that is uh, CPP and RWDE, and uh, we we as, as we decide to go to these um, two leaders, uh, we we can have the different perspectives that they have 
when they study the, the, the wind. That is finally the, the, the results may be the same, but not always the, the approach to, to reach these results is the same. And uh, it allows us to, to have uh, as much much knowledge as, as possible. Of course, uh, as I told, we did uh, full elastic studies for all of our trackers before uh, or during the, the development of, of any new product. Um, about the alarm system, um, we have an integrated alarm system that is not only a switch on, switch on system. Okay, uh, we can avoid, uh, uh, we prevent uh, wind events, uh, we prepare uh, uh, to resist the snow loads, very high snow loads, high storms, floods and other problems on the tracker like battery communications and any other uh, um, over consumption or other, any other problem that we can receive from, from, from the, from the tracker. Uh, as I told, this is not only a switch on switch off. Uh, we really have a detailed um, um, check of how it's happening and we adapt our tracking for these uh, uh, circumstances. For example, if battery is, is going down because, uh, is because um, we can have a, a lot of movements or, or a reduction on the <clears throat> need, uh, we not go to a stop position suddenly. Uh, when we receive this 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 uh, problem, first we go to a tracking angle, uh, to a lower tracking angle near to the stop position, that uh, allow us to be uh, secure uh, in a very low time, and uh, to continue producing uh, energy as much time as possible with the more efficiency. Of course, uh, Vanguard 2P and Agile 1P are very different trackers. They have different approach, uh, as I told you before. Uh, they have different store strategies. And uh, it means that uh, it has a, a different uh, approach to this um, uh, alarm system. <clears throat> um, next, uh, I will speak about uh, validations. Um, our quality control when we design a part is a very um, very rigid one and uh, only when we are sure that uh, one part is fully secure we we are able to release it uh, during the develop time we will always make uh, quality inspections uh, integration and assembly of the on the tracker of all these parts uh, we make functional tests, maximum load capacity tests, durability tests, and of course, uh, we, we check all regulations that are needed for the industry. Uh, for example, here we can show an sleep drive uh, making an environmental test on the, on the left side, and uh, a dynamic uh, load test that we do on the sleep drive to check that uh, the maximum load uh, or Really, we have some security coefficients. We, we make more load than it will have in the real installation, uh, and we check that uh, the living drive will be able to move with the better quality <coughs> and uh, performance. On the right side, uh, we can see a, a life cycle test. We make a life cycle test of the full tracker, and not only of the um, individual parts. Uh, uh, to validate uh, not only this part working alone, but also the, the world tracker working. Uh, we, on this life cycle test, of course, uh, we may we put some additional weight to simulate uh, the different loads that we expect to have during all the operation time. <coughs> Finally, uh, about quality. Um, of course, we, we make a very high, uh, very detailed uh, quality inspection of all our components before it goes to the to our clients. But uh, our quality procedure not only covers this. Uh, it starts on the development of the product when we um, take all the client and market requirements 
and uh, when we are making this this develop uh, always we are evaluating supplier uh, characteristics and um, and how they can do with high quality standards and of course it is a it is not a one line direction process uh, always uh, we are looking for for the for the problems or, or issues that we have when we produce and always we are we are um, developing new solutions or adapting our components to have the better quality in, of, in all of them this is it is all <laughs> Thank you, Felix. Yes, and nice to hear from the engineering and R&D side of Trina Tracker today. Obviously, uh, we can see there that you are the focus on stability and reliability is uh, crucial. And, um, I thought it was very interesting to see the wind tunnel testing um, uh, taking place there. Uh, so now we jump across to Alvaro Galagos, head of operations at Trina Tracker, taking us through further insights around components and direct O&M activities. Um, Alvaro, just before you start, a little warning that we're running a little long on time and we want to make sure we have time for questions, so you may need to keep it moving, um, but take it away, it's all yours. Okay, I will do my best. Hello everyone, uh, I, will, I will go through this uh, part of the webinar that is composed of several blocks, first of which will be a reduction of components and uh, sorry component reductions in the in, in the tracker, both two import trade and one import trade models, direct and indirect O&M cost, uh, preventive O&M activities, corrective O&M, uh, and uh, in, in how failure ratio uh, impacts, and at the end, how all these preventive corrective uh, activities um, comes into the model and we obtain the O&M cost reduction with uh, new trackers. Okay, so let's start uh, by the first part, which is uh, component reduction in Vanguard 2P. Okay. The, the reduction of components has been mainly achieved uh, based on market, on market trends. Uh, as you know, uh, apart from producing trackers, we are also an uh, important player in, in modules. So we combine the ultra high powered modules with longer trackers and we got that the installed power per tracker is more than double than in previous models. Or said otherwise, a uh, number of trackers required per megawatt are less than half than in previous models, okay? Second, second highlight at this stage is that the reduction in number of components during the design stage is focused especially on all of all those which are most demanding from an o &M perspective. Basically, motors, bearings, and tracker joints. With this, we will be able to reduce the o &M cost during the operational phase. Okay? Now, let's go quickly to, to, to see how, how it works in two import trade model, Vanguard. Uh, here, the number, the, the power per tracker increased by 101%. Number of trackers per megawatt reduced accordingly in 50.3%. And the most demanding components like bearings reduced 49.1%. And most motorized actuators minus 50.3 percent number of motors same quantity and number of joints minus 24.3 percent you, you can see that total actuators is uh, the number is increased 62.8 percent this is because uh, the new two import uh, tracker is designed with an innovative multi-drive system which procures more security and safety to the tracker okay so now let's see how it works in the one import rate here. The comparison is only established, in, will be established in terms of the number of trackers per megawatt and number of bearings, because really the new tracker model has been designed with a new driving system, which is slow and drive instead of linear actuator. That was a previous model, okay? So that's why 
uh, the, the, the figures will not be relevant by comparison. Okay, so only bearings and number of trackers per megawatt. In this case, the number of trackers per megawatt reduction achieved is 38.2 percent, and number of bearings is minus 50.5 percent. So let's move to the next part or block, which is the direct and indirect O&M activities. Direct O&M activities uh, are the tasks associated with preventive maintenance of the tracker that are performed on the field to avoid predictable tracker failures, which is the main, the main target in our company. Okay? Main activities, uh, main direct activities performed outside are motors lubrication, actuator lubrication, checking, visual checking of torque tightening values, visual checking of alignment, checking of electrical and mechanical connection, as well as in kilometer calibration and time synchronization for the TCUs, um, and also the checking of electrical and mechanical connections and the correct functioning of alarms regarding the sensors package. Here, I also included the, the, the motor overconsumption, which is not really a task to be performed during operational stage, but it is so relevant and so important that I included here. It is very important to supervise the correct file tolerances during the assembly stage. Okay. Regarding the indirect O&M activities, indirect O&M activities are not really activities that are performed on the field, but are a kind of inputs that are needed during design stage in order to make compatible tracker design with the module cleaning system that might be robot or machinery, uh, and also the ground module clearance input. All this information we need to receive during the engineering stage to, to compatibilize during the uh, design stage, tracker design, with all these parameters. It will make possible during operational phase the compatibilization and the reduction in O&M cost. These parameters are very important to be received during the engineering stage. So we are able to make them compatible with our tracker design early stage of the projects. It will revert into a consistent uh, O&M reduction later on. Okay. Let's go to the next block, which are uh, preventive maintenance calculations or estimations. Here, um, it, they are calculated uh, according to following parameters. We need the units per megawatt of all those components which are, which are subject to maintenance. We need the time per action in megawatt uh, to check. We need the inspection frequency coefficient. As an example, a motor or actuator lubrication is done by yearly or sensors package uh, 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 inspection is done yearly, but there are other activities which are done every three years, like tracker control units check. Okay, so the inspection frequency coefficient and a recommended sampling for each and every of these activities to be performed. By the multiplication of these four factors, we will get the average of preventive O&M time um, in terms of hours, year, and 100 megawatts, because 100 megawatts if, is, is the, the size that we use to calculate, okay? So, uh, in case of uh, Vanguard to import trade, uh, the total preventive uh, maintenance time estimation is 158 hours a year and 100 megawatts. And for our two import trade, uh, for our uh, one import trade model, so called Agile, the estimation is 168 hours a year per 100 megawatts. Now let's move to the next block, which is the failure rate and how it impacts in the corrective maintenance. When preventive maintenance fails, corrective maintenance needs to be carried out. Failure rate 
is the key parameter to assess and quantify time and cost for corrective or unplanned maintenance. The failure rate is the indicator of tracker reliability. And Trina Tracker target is to reduce the failure rate in order to achieve the maximum energy production and consequently the level I, a reduction in the level I scope for us of energy, the LCOE. Most relevant impact in failure rate reduction is, sustained, is obtained in new tracker models by component reduction. It's very important, especially all those which are most, most demanding from a no one perspective, and also by design innovation. In this case, as Felix told in, in the previous blog, the uh, most important, most probably are the, the W piles, the new uh, spherical bearing design, and Trina clamp design. Okay, so failure rate uh, is calculated in percentage as number of failed units into number of units deployed and time period in years. Okay. Let's see now how we estimate the preventive, the, the corrective maintenance for our two import rate models and one import rate models. Okay. Here, as you can see, the formula we use, the main parameters are units per megawatt in number, replacement, replacement time per unit, because something fails, okay, and the failure rate per component in percentage. By the multiplication of these three factors, we will get, we will get the unplanned O and N time in terms of hours a year and 100 megawatt estimation. For our Vanguard model, the estimation is 5.16 hours a year and 100 megawatt. And for our one import rate model, Agile, the estimation is 5.16. 26 hours a year and 100 megawatts. Now we will move to the last block of the of this uh, part of the webinar, which is a uh, final impact in O&M cost of the tracker during the operational phase. Okay. In the case of uh, we, we, we analyze separately the two import rate Vanguard model and one import rate uh, Agile model. For the two import rate uh, Vanguard model, we used a project size of 100 megawatts, an ultra high power module of 550 watts, and a configuration of 112 modules per tracker, single row tracker. Okay. Labor rate we considered is $43 an hour. We considered an annual labor inflation of 2% and a discount rate for net present value of 8%. With all these values and preventive and corrective maintenance values obtained previously, the estimated operation and maintenance cost reduction achieved with Trina Tracker uh, Vanguard 2P with regards to the previous 2P tracker model is a reduction of 33%. And for our uh, Agile one in portrait model, the uh, raw data we introduce in the model, apart from corrective and preventive O&M cost, okay, it is a project size of 100 megawatts, ultra high power modules of 550 watts. Uh, this, are, this is a B row tracker, so it is 57 modules per row, total 114 modules per tracker we consider same parameters of labor rate of 43 us dollars an hour and an annual labor inflation of two percent and a discount rate for net present value of an eight percent this way the estimation of a reduction in operation and maintenance cost achieved with trina tracker agile one import rate model compared to the previous dual row model is 25 percent i hope you enjoyed this uh, part of the webinar and now um, Tristan will will introduce next.
Yes, thank you, Alvaro. A uh, really nice wrap there of what you're seeing in ONM um, and what operators can expect uh, to do each year um, on, on each of your systems and uh, how the uh, trackers are improving through the models, I thought was uh, some interesting insight. So thank you very much there. And finally, we go to Steve Caldwell, uh, Senior Project Manager at Ends in Australia, ahead of the Q&A session. Um, we are getting your questions. Please keep sending them in. Um, I suspect we may even go over time um, for this uh, for this session, um, but that's 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 great. We look forward to that. Um, and Steve, uh, you're ready to go. Take it away. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, greetings to all. Uh, I'd like to recognise the previous contributors from Trina, and uh, also welcome everybody that's joined in. Uh, firstly, I would like to give a brief overview of uh, NZ. Um, NZ is a global knowledge enterprise specialising in the energy and water industries. Our mission is to make these two life essentials more affordable, accessible and sustainable to all. Through deep domain expertise, innovative technologies and collaboration with the best and brightest people, NZN's objective is to influence the energy and water industries to drive positive change around the world. The company's three main areas of focus are digitalization, decentralization, and decarbonization. These are further made up of different centers of excellence which specialize in particular innovations and solutions. One centre of excellence is the energy asset development section, which I am associated with. EAD Australia participates uh, for EPC projects in the market and also uh, developing renewable projects in its own right and expanding our O&M portfolio. Uh, firstly, I'd like to recognise the complexity um, of operating an array uh, over, uh, a, you know, in a harsh environment um, that these systems have to uh, perform in year in, year out uh, for up to 30 plus years of operational lifespan. Uh, acknowledging the uh, previous presenters, uh, Trina's efforts in int introducing um, a reduction in components and the rationale of monitoring aspects to better support O&M maintenance with predictive targeted inspections. Uh, where to start here? When challenged with this task, O&M industry best practice is always a benchmark uh, that we can fall back on and these uh, this information is readily available in our marketplace. Acknowledging availability guarantees of uh, renewable projects being between 97 and 99 percent per annum um, it sort of highlights the need for predictive uh, maintenance regimes. If you look at uh, 99 percent over a calendar year, that uh, equates to three days a year where you uh, are not available to generate, which uh, is not. Um, a great amount of time to uh, go through corrective maintenance. Understanding BEC's best practice means um, setting yourself up to perform minimal amount of inspections to align yourself with best practice. And then from there, you should always look to optimise industry best practice. Now, if I could just switch to the webcam again, Tristan. Yeah, we can see you there. We can see you there, Steve. Uh, oh, very good, very good. So, uh, um, actually, wait. I'll just uh, need to turn you back on. I think. One second. Okay. There we go. We see you now. All good. Keep going. So the three main areas uh, that are required to achieve uh, availability guarantees. Uh, number one, preventative maintenance. Uh, in doing that, you have to identify tasks, uh, prioritise the importance of those tasks, allocate frequency, 
and you also need to allocate the extent. So uh, daily, quarterly, semi-annual or yearly. Uh, are we looking at the total installation? Are we looking at a defined subset or are we looking at random subsets? Predictive maintenance, uh, utilising OEM, OEM recommendations uh, and utilising site data acquisition. Obviously, corrective maintenance, uh, there's a goal to keep this to an absolute minimum uh, and therefore uh, the following activities can be utilised to ascertain areas of potential failure. So with all data collection from the build, uh, civil construction, uh, including uh, surface preparation, cuts of fill and compaction, water course management, and analysing all non-conformance reports. So all NCRs that are generated during the build of the uh, soda farm surface, uh, which is where Trina's uh, system interfaces to, uh, and looking at the uh, corrective actions associated with those NCRs. This provides a base data uh, of the build to assist in identifying areas of potential failure. Differential settlement through uh, cut to fill activities no matter how good the compaction is during the build, will identify potential areas of failure in the substrate and therefore prioritise the inspection or measurement of ground conditions. Also acknowledging the uh, bomb data or weather data um, against the design for watercourse management and overland flow will also highlight areas of priority for inspection. The use of uh, UAV thermographic and inspection uh, uh, techniques, looking at topographical data acquisition and inspection of tolerances within the system, the array system, will also uh, identify priorities in the inspection process. Inspections post O and M activities. Uh, so vegetation management, it sounds like a pretty simplistic exercise, but often uh, plant associated with the vegetation management can create issues with the tracker. So it's imperative that these activities are monitored and also built into your frequency and uh, inspection regimes. Logging O&M activities uh, diligently uh, will also contribute towards uh, traits or trends that are developing in the field. So therefore, um, random inspections on various parts of the system will identify areas of uh, non-conformance and should promote a, a renewed uh, review of uh, activities. So what do we do with all this data? Well, uh, as you've heard from Trina Tracker, uh, managing all this data is about predicting failure rates and avoiding corrective maintenance. NZEN uh, will be also looking at the build data civil and the effects of uh, that data in mapping it alongside weather to also predict activities of inspection and point out corrective maintenance areas uh, or sorry preventative maintenance areas to avoid corrective maintenance. Thank you, Tristan. I'll hand back to yourself. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks for running us through uh, your insights there. Um, and that brings us now to the uh, question and answer session. So uh, we have a lot of questions of interest. Uh, thanks for submitting them um, as we've discussed throughout. Uh, so I think we'll try and start with some general questions and then get into some more specifics. Um, so if each of the presenters could come back, turn on your cameras, 
um, I'll bring up the questions and we'll try and find the right person to answer. But of course, feel free to jump in, uh, presenters, if you if you feel like you're the right person. So um, let's get straight into it. Um, I can see you're all coming back. That's great. Um, so uh, a question here, how can you report failures uh, for the Vanguard 1P and Agile 2P when these uh, new tracker series were so recently installed? Who should I put okay. that to? Alvaro, yes. This data yeah, yeah. So these data are, are estimations based on uh, theoretical models and previous tracker types of Trina of Trina tracker, weighed by the component reduction and uh, design innovations, reducing the failure rate. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and uh, what? Avara, we'll stick with you. What is the average annual O&M cost per megawatt of um, either the 1P or the 2P solution? The annual cost for the Vanguard to import trade is uh, $115 year. <laughs> yeah, $115,000. Uh, every 100 megawatts and 30 year period of uh, lifetime of the tracker. And for the uh, B row agile one import trade, it is 118 US dollars every 100 megawatt and 30 years uh, lifetime of the projects. Okay, yep, so some maths there to work it out per megawatt. Yep. Um, is there a minimum size where trackers can be deployed? Um, we're sort of getting some questions around, you know, can I can I start with a, a 250 kilowatt installation or you know, sh should we really be looking at a, a larger installation to, to start? Um, how, does, how does that work? Um, and I'm not sure who that might be best for, but Alvaro, if you could start maybe. Or could you repeat, Tristan, I couldn't hear. Yeah, no problem, let me, let me say it again. So um, someone's asking, or a few questions here are asking uh, the minimum size where trackers can be deployed. So what, what size of, of, of park uh, would you start considering using trackers? Um, someone mentioned a 250 kilowatt uh, starting point. Is that too small or is that sufficient? Well, it, 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 it depends. It depends. It depends on, on countries. As an example, in Chile, because it is a 3,000 kilometers strip of country, they are focused on small projects, very well distributed along the geography. So average is around between 3 and 10 megawatts per project, okay, according to a country strat strategy. And there are other countries like in China, in which they are mm, uh, building uh, two gigawatts or in Middle East, it, it depends. Uh, they, uh, in, in our company, we have performed from half giga projects to 0 0.3 uh, megawatts project. It's not a, uh, it's not a matter of, of, of size in, in this case. Okay. Uh, I want to add something here. Uh, we okay. have a special solution developed especially for small projects that is uh, like a supermarket solution okay? where uh, we reduce uh, all calculations uh, and most of the of the tasks uh, that uh, for, for a big project is not a very big cost but for these small projects can be can be a problem because it represents a, a very big part of the of the cost of the of the trucker and we develop a, a, a standard solution that uh, uh, reduce all of these costs and can be used for, for these small projects uh, to, to allow our clients to save money if they want to, to use our trackers. Yeah, if they want to uh, save money, yes. <laughs> go, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I, I was, that's a good point, Felix. I was going to mention that, um, you know, that there's a, a fixed cost um, to trackers that uh, is not prevalent in, you know, where we, where we can, pairing against fixed tilt solutions so you know whether it's a one megawatt or a hundred megawatts both within Trina and our suppliers the same team of people need to spring into action uh, to facilitate that order so we find that uh, you know really the, the track has become you know it, it kind of on an academic basis more more viable from a three megawatt and upwards maybe down to two megawatts uh, it becomes more challenging to get the numbers to stack up Kind of below two megawatts but as felix mentions we, we've taken a, 
a cookie cutter approach uh, to productize the, the tracker for these smaller sites to, to try and compress down some of that fixed cost so we can we can try and start addressing some of the more DG uh, oriented markets. Gotcha. Andy, sticking with you for a second, um, some more financial questions. So someone's asked here, uh, for financial modeling, is it common to consider some uh, replacements in the tracking system after you know a, a given 10 or 15 years? Or is it more reasonable to consider only fixed annual uh, uh, operating expense or OPEX um, amounts to, to be considered? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the standard warranty on our on our kit is uh, five years for the electromechanical, the motors, the controllers, um, the weather stations, and so forth, and ten years on the on the structural parts. Uh, we we do provide spare parts quantities and pricing uh, as standard to our customers. Uh, the quantities of which are predicated on uh, in theory enabling an, an uptime of in excess of 99%. Um, you know, th there's other elements to, to uptime aside from the tracking performance, the quality of the installation, execution, the the, the administration of the, the required O&M and so forth, how close to site the, those critical spare parts are, are stored as well. But um, yeah, we we would, uh, I, I think, in our, and I'll let Alvaro elab elaborate, I think that component replacement does come into the, the financials as well as part of the corrective maintenance. Yeah, Alvaro, do you want to add anything to that? As part of the corrective maintenance cost, we are including the cost of replacement of the of the pieces. So it's included in the, in the model. Okay, that's great. Um, and then sort of leading on with that is, is how do we compare the outcome against the estimated liberalized cost of energy um, and what are the parameters to monitor there in particular? Who wants to jump in? Could you repeat that again? Sorry, Tristan. Yeah, no problems. It's not phrased particularly well, so just, just bear with, um, with what you understand here. But so someone says, how do we compare the outcome you know, I guess the, the actual physical, uh, what, what's installed against the estimated uh, levelized cost of energy and what are the main parameters uh, to monitor to, to understand the, the, the comparison here? And I think uptime certainly comes into it. Uh, you, you know, it's important to partner with a tracker supplier who can point to a, a solid track record of deployment and uh, independent verification on uptime. Uh, you know, trackers are inherently dynamic structures with parts that move and are motorized, that which you, you don't get with a fixed solution. So that it does entail a slightly higher level of technology risk that is not uh, as prevalent in fixed tilt. So you know, it's more more important to partner with, uh, as I say, the more the more bankable offerings in the market from that perspective. Um, also, uh, uh, you know, I think it hopefully it gives confidence in the, the metrics around our O and M. Uh, uh, you know, for preventive maintenance and, and corrective, that we can we can go into such granular detail and, and uh, enable our customers to build those bottom-up O&M OPEX models. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, when when we go to that level of detail, that uh, there's there's fewer assumptions that need to be made and less uh, less propensity for misinterpretation or, or cost blowouts. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. I hope that answers the uh, the, the question there from from the uh, from the audience. Um, there's a supply chain question here, which is a, which is a big topic at Intersolar as well. Um, uh, so a question here just about stock availability availability uh, production levels and if there's any delays being experienced uh, both here or if it's uh, affecting future models uh, coming out as well. Um, maybe Felix. Maybe Andy. Uh, yes, uh, about uh, availability and supply chain, uh, we are a uh, uh, <clears throat> global company. It means that uh, we have production areas in different countries, and uh, it allows us to 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 don't uh, or to be able to to prevent problems if there is any supply supply issue or something like that with any country. For example, at my factories of tracker production, 
uh, was in Spain and in China. And depending on the, the location of the site or, or the conditions uh, of, the, of the cost of materials and so on, uh, we are able to decide for, for each project and for each case uh, where we will um, where will be the better option to 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 produce all of these parts. And uh, some of our suppliers uh, for for components, uh, for external components like uh, piles and, and torches and so on, um, are distributed uh, around the world, and, and we are able to, to to jump any restrictions or problem that we we have. Yeah, we we've, we've got a, a seven gigawatt production capacity um, amongst our, our global fleet of production centres, as, as Felix says. You know, it's a highly disrupted landscape at the minute, and not just in terms of the the raw materials, but also shipping. You know, I think most of the people on the call will be familiar with the the precipitous increases in in shipping costs that seem to have quadrupled in in the space of a year. So that that's really forced us to um, to explore alternative uh, implementation strategies and fulfillment models, going with more local content oriented approaches. Um, so we, we've qualified a number of vendors in India to try and circumvent that, that high shipping cost. Um, and we've won our first few deals in India now. Uh, and also avoiding things like import tax and, and duties and so forth. Um, we're in ongoing in qualifying a number of uh, suppliers in Australia because of local, uh, state government local content drivers. So you know, I think you'll, you'll probably see an increased decentralization of uh, supply chain models while the, while the global landscape remains so, so disrupted. Isn't that a challenge? Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting um, and interesting to hear the mitigation strategies going on. Um, uh, I think something something um, sort of switching across a little bit uh, is uh, people asking me about module lifetime. Um, so uh, you know, there's a sort of uh, question around. Okay, modules on trackers aren't fixed on all sides. So the wind loads, as we saw, are being tested. Um, wind loads can bend the modules to a higher grade. Um, and does that uh, cause more micro cracks? Um, and what are the mitigation strategies? There's sort of a, a second question here, uh, which you might, we might as well tackle at the same time, which is um, how large PV modules uh, can be fixed sufficiently with only um, that short uh, middle clamp that, that um, Felix discussed. Um, once upon a time, I think it was advised to fix modules um, at each quarter point. Um, and so frame heights have decreased a little bit. So yeah, a couple of questions there around um, modules um, and perhaps Alvaro, maybe you, you want to jump in? I think this is, this is, this is for, for Felix. <laughs> yes. Okay, sure. No, it's... <laughs> okay. Uh, first of all, I, I want to, to, to show that uh, we was uh, in Trina. Uh, we are able to to have uh, the knowledge uh, or to know uh, the next generation panels before it go to the market, and it allow, allow us to to make all tests before uh, it go to to the to the projects. Um, uh, other benefit that we have being only one company making all panels and, and trackers is that uh, uh, our Trina panels are fully tested with our problems. We, we not only make uh, um, individual tests with problems and individual tests with uh, panels and later we make a, a lot of tests to, to verify that uh, all is okay, but also uh, we, we make uh, all, all life cycle tests um, um, with uh, the combination of the two components for all the panels. It means that uh, uh, we make um, a very, very detailed analysis of and test of, of all uh, of, of this of the joint between panel and pulling. And we know that this is the most of the critical joints on the on the on the tracker. Uh, we have several solutions. Uh, the Trina clamp uh, is, is one solution that was tested and working for four years. Uh, we, we, of course, we don't have a lot of, uh, of these uh, solutions with the new panels because it is very recently launched to the market, but uh, we have uh, for the previous generation, we have tested it uh, on projects, on real projects for, for several years, so working, working very, very well. 
and without any problem. Um, really, uh, it, this trina clamp uh, may look a, a short uh, fixation solution, but uh, um, really it is better than a, a traditional purling because it's not only fixed with two screws, the, the panel. It, uh, you have a, a long clamp outside and, and a, a support downside that uh, helps a lot to the panel frame to support the loads. Uh, this is especially designed for 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 the aisle for one p trucker, and for two p trucker uh, we have uh, a, a longer pulling okay, that cover uh, most of the part of the panel and uh, allow he to resist the, the loads. And as I told before, on this type of trucker, the the focus on the two panel truckers, the focus are to reduce the the pressure on the panel. It means that we go to a zero degrees stop position and the loads and pressures on the panel are are very are, are lower than uh, than in other solutions. And uh, finally. Um, I want to add that uh, we, we make uh, we joined the, the results that we receive from the wind channel test to the panel uh, loads and it allows us to to not only make uh, a continuous pressure on the panels to verify the pullings but also we make uh, distributed loads and dynamic uh, uh, and life cycle tests that uh, simulates how the loads are really um, um, who really happen on the panels because uh, it is not a uniform load and sometimes uh, it can be um, um, uh, not done this this detail test okay sure uh anything else from anyone otherwise i think we'll uh may that might be a good place to leave it so if there's anything else to add otherwise we're good okay great uh, so yeah, that's a great place to leave us for today. Big thanks to you all for joining us. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. I know we went over, but um, we always want to uh, let the audience questions um, make it into, uh, to our pre presenters. Um, that's what we're all about here. So we really do value those uh, contributions to the discussions. Uh, big thanks, of course, to Andy, Alvaro, Felix, and Steve for sharing their presentations and expertise with us, and everyone at Trina Tracker, and of course my colleagues behind the scenes here at PB Magazine who worked hard to put on. A great program for us today. Uh, one more time, if you're looking out for this info, everyone will receive Trina's white paper and link to the webinar recording with a follow-up email post-event. Keep an eye out for that for all the full details. We've had a lot of questions about that, so yeah, you will get it, don't worry. Uh, otherwise, the October edition of PV Magazine is out now and features a detailed look at a big battery fire in Australia, insights into reuse of second-hand modules, and a huge amount more, as you see, each and every month uh, please do use the coupon code there for a saving on your subscription and look out because around the corner is the November edition of the magazine with a hive of editing activity wrapping up tomorrow um, and I'm part of that so uh, as soon as this webinar ends that's where I'll be going to. So stay tuned and uh, look out for a really unique cover from an amazing artist we work with so something a little bit different. Um, and as always on the website we have fresh solar and renewable industry news published each and every day. Um, you'll see there our most read online at the moment uh, is uh, a piece by Blake Matic on solar farms proving to be beehives of economic activity, uh, somewhat linked to bees themselves. Um, and Mark Hutchins there with uh, a piece on big modules heading for standardizations, uh, which is uh, seems like it's been overdue and now happening. Um, and not only that, we have plenty more great webinars coming up as well. There's actually a really big program of webinars. so. Join in uh, for what suits you and, and your uh, colleagues. So tomorrow, Tuesday, with the talented Marian Villun present, uh, moderating, we have uh, PV on the Northern Roof, a proposition for the cold season, which um, goes a little uh, counterintuitive. Um, so I'm really interested to see that. Uh, and then on Wednesday, we have purchasing modules in 2022. What should be in your purchase contract uh, with the amazing Becky Beats guiding a series of present presentations on potential pitfalls that companies may uh miss c miss c um purchase agreements and more and i'm also back on deck on november 3rd with another another webinar focusing on utility scale storage systems so once again thank you all for watching this webinar and for wherever you are in the world good morning good evening good night and we look forward to seeing you again soon thank you thank you